Hello, everyone. My name is Wendy Cho. I'm the Content and Outreach Senior Manager at Actera. Uh, welcome to our Spring 2023 Lecture Series, the second event. And it's also um, our Green Team Network Spring Forum. Uh, the event today is called Commercial Kitchens in an Electric Era. And uh, we're very excited to have Anna Bobat and Nahum Goldberg with us today. First, I'll just open with a little background on Actera. Uh, we are a 50 plus year old environmental nonprofit organization. Fun fact, we were born on Earth Day in, ni on 19 in 1970. Uh, we're based in Palo Alto, California. Our mission is to bring people together to create local solutions for a healthy planet. And we do this by encouraging individual behavior change and individual actions, as well as encouraging policy advocacy. You can find out more about us at actera.org. So here's some of our work in how we are combating climate change. We have four primary pillars. One is beneficial electrification for all, which is about accelerating the transition to gas-free, fossil-free transportation and buildings. We have food and climate change, which involves reducing greenhouse gas emissions by reducing food waste and also by encouraging plant-forward diets. We have an education and youth pillar, which works with students and teachers. And we have workplace sustainability, which many of you are familiar with if you are part of the Green Team Network. Um, we're also celebrating our Business Environmental Awards program this year. More about the education pillar, which is what houses the public lecture series. We have the Youth Be the Change program, which is a free curriculum for climate change for teachers and students to help students better understand the problems of climate change and also be part of the solution. We have this public lecture series, which brings in experts from many different backgrounds to talk about relevant topics for climate change and climate solutions. We have our very new program, Actera's Student Ambassadors Program, also known as ASAP, which helps high school students and college students become better advocates in their community by learning how to make public comments and participate in the public pro policy process. And we have our third and final lecture of this series coming up on May 18th. We're excited to welcome Steve Anglin from We Solar, and the uh, title of his presentation will be Innovation and Progress in Concentrating Solar Power. So please join us uh, for this virtual event on May 18th at noon Pacific time. We have a few other really exciting events. This is Earth Month, so we have a lot of things going on. We have a plant-based market at the Love Our Earth Festival. If you're in person in the Bay Area, please join us in Atherton on April 22nd, Earth Day. We have an induction cooktops workshop uh, through our Green at Home program, which is happening on April 26th in the evening at 6 p.m. That's virtual. And we have our in-person celebration in San Francisco on May 11th to celebrate the Business Environmental Awards program. We hope you can all join us for that date. Thank you so much to our series underwriters, Mary and Cl Clinton Gilliland, and Armand and Elian Nukermans for helping make this program possible. We also have several sponsors to thank. We're very grateful to the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, as well as uh, LinkedIn and our partners, the Foster and Green Team Network. Thank you so much. And of course, we wouldn't be able to do this without the support we receive from the community, from members like you. So please um, feel free to visit our donation page and help us keep these events possible. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, we will have time for question and answer. So please um, hold on to those questions and you can always type them into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. And you can also view other people's questions and upvote other questions that have already been asked. So we really hope that you will be encouraged to use this feature so we can have a nice dialogue with our panelists. And uh, it's time to welcome our speakers. So we have Anna Bobot. She's the Global Food Program Manager at LinkedIn, where she influences nutrition, marketing, communication, sustainability, sourcing, food operations, and food service design, as well as on-site food education and engagement programs. She is a certified holistic nutrition consultant and the founder of the Women in Tech Networking Group, um, which was founded to help uh, female leaders in the corporate and university dining industry network. 
Anna joined LinkedIn in 2013 and has managed food service operations in the San Francisco Bay Area LinkedIn offices, feeding over 5,000 people daily. And our second speaker also is Nahum Goldberg. He's principal design and operations consultant at NG Associates. He is a project designer and lead consultant for projects in the areas of food service design, concept development, operational consulting and planning with regional and international project experience. He works with organizations, architects and developers. Nahum has 35 plus years of experience in the US and the global market in the management of food service operations, training, innovation design and kitchen equipment contract management. So it is my great pleasure to welcome our speakers. So Nahum, uh, it is all yours, take it away. So thank you, Wendy, and to Actera for inviting us to present today and your work in the areas of education and community activism. Um, also, I'd like to acknowledge Anna Bobot and LinkedIn as leaders in the industry, both for their environmental initiatives and amazing, amazing food programs. Um, NGA is a food service design consulting firm. So I think today I'm just gonna give some perspective from our view of what we're dealing with on projects that are going all electric, some of the sustainability issues and the trends and um, findings that we've, we've come across. So let's go into the topic that has become central to many of our consulting and design projects today, commercial kitchen electrification. Based on studies by leading energy organizations, commercial food service industries, uh, industry uses five to seven times more energy per square foot than, than other commercial buildings. So we'll do a brief overview of options and challenges of going all electric from our perspective as design consultants. There are a lot of wins, moving away from fossil fuels and their harm, harmful byproducts, reduced energy usage overall, improved air quality and comfort in the kitchen and cleaner and healthier workplaces. So where are commercial kitchens found? Well, lucky for our industry, commercial kitchens are found everywhere in all sectors. They're changing, but they're not going away. People need to eat. And rapidly we're seeing the spread of all electric kitchens across all sectors from quick service to, forms of, to all forms of restaurants and institutions. Whether there's a decision to go all electric or not, the topic is discussed on just about every project we're dealing with now. And this is because more and more jurisdictions are focusing on renewable energy initiatives. Clean Energy States Alliance created, created this great map showing some of the development um, of states that are kind of adopting, uh, showing regions that have adopted official zero uh, greenhouse gas or 100% renewable energy goals for their power sector or for the whole economy. Worth noting at the time of this map, uh, when the map was made, California, Massachusetts, and North Carolina are having power sector and economic, economic, economy-wide policy um, in place. And then there's early adopters and leaders. We're seeing big changes in our industry based on leadership and vision of both industry and government. Our long established involvement in large scale food service projects has allowed us a great uh, learning experience and we'll share some of these here. Electric cooking solutions are not something new. All of the main types of equipment have been available in electric or gas ever since the industry was established. They're generally more efficient electrically and in most cases lower in procurement costs than comparable gas items. So that's kind of a misconception that some people think that electric is more expensive across the board, generally not. We did a uh, electric equipment solutions, um, uh, kind of a check-in on different sec on different um, types of equipment. So electric equipment solutions are readily available in the U.S. market. For a recent study, we looked at key types of electric equipment from brazing pans to walk ranges and everything in between. The brands shown in black have options which are approved and available in North American market. Uh, the other ones in red are generally European or Asian market items that are not quite ready for the US market or haven't been approved here. Uh, worth noting is that the European and Asian markets are much better developed and have broader offerings, but a good portion are not yet certified here. Looking at costs, 
we looked at costs, gas versus basic electric versus induction. So combination ovens, convection ovens, fryers, and skillets all tend to be less expensive than their gas equivalents. Induction options are quite a bit higher for initial costs, but one should not forget that the dramatic, uh, forget that there are dramatic energy savings and other benefits which offset this over time. And operationally, they're much cleaner and easier to maintain. We also see that induction equipment is becoming more available from multiple sources and costs should go down with uh, greater competition and options in the market. Induction is not limited to range tops only. These are just some examples of induction cooking used for warming and holding that are available today. Also, uh, dedicated teaching and demo kitchens are generally not scrutinized by the health department. So less prone to have to have the NSF or NC uh, ETL sanitation um, seal on them. So for, for those type of kitchens, teaching kitchens that are not used for production, um, we have some great options to bring in sleek residential induction cooktops and ranges. There are some challenges. So unique action cooking and culturally important cooking methods are some of the most challenging applications to provide in all electric version, but solutions do exist. So each unique equipment solution or application warrants a conversation around the culinary and aesthetic aspects. Test kitchens are available as our factory visits, and we really encourage culinary teams to test out new equipment and cooking methods before finalizing equipment decisions on a project. Key challenges on the implementation technical side. Equipment must be certified for use in the US, as I mentioned. That means local health departments generally require having NSF, ANSI, or ETL sanitation seal of approval. Conversion of existing kitchens from gas to electric or new projects in existing buildings may require bringing in additional electric capacity, which can be very costly. It takes time, approvals from the utility companies. And then equipment disconnects can be a huge unsightly interference in the kitchen operations. And I'll go into that in, on the next slide. So among all of these issues, we kind of focus, we focus on them in collaboration with the electrical engineers who are a part of most every project that is getting designed. Electrical disconnects, um, safety disconnects are for high powered electrical equipment and they're required so that they can be serviced, um, disconnected and serviced. So the, the um, image on the right indicates kind of the old school approach, which we're trying to discourage and um, get all of those safety disconnects into the um, actual electrical panels so that the lockouts can take place there. So there's challenges around this, but it's something that needs to be discussed on every project. Otherwise you have uh, a jungle of gray boxes with red handles sticking out in workspace. <laughs> Another solution uh, for electrical disconnects and systems in general is a utility wall. So these can have removable panels to allow flexibility for future equipment shifts or changes and can help in the design of an open, transparent kitchen environment. Ventless cooking solutions add a myriad of options for the electric kitchen. And I, I didn't wanna overlook them here. All ventless solutions are electric by default. Uh, by going ventless for the right application, there can be significant savings on energy and infrastructure needed to provide exhaust to hoods, ducts, and fans. As kitchen design consultants, we work through a process of understanding the client's needs from an organizational and policy perspective and from culinary execution and guest experience perspective. And then we offer appropriate solutions and options. Key points to look at when specifying new or less familiar technologies. Is the product market tested? Does it have service and support available? What are the costs to operate and maintain the equipment? And of course, smaller and multi multifunctional solutions are the best. 
Each organization pro and project we deal with is different and there are different applications and solutions worth looking at. As we wrap up, we'll go through four quickly and point out some highlights and unique features. Roche has a unique sustainability guideline uh, coming uh, globally, um, established basically from their headquarters in Basel, Switzerland. And they, they call it the K6 requirements. And that's for every project for Roche and Genentech. Uh, worth mentioning is they're all electric. They've been this way for quite some time. They have a strict regimen for years requiring R290 refrigerants and better. And now, um, which are now more readily available due to US catching up with, with the standard, standard. Also, all of the walk-in coolers are uh, CO2, use CO2-based refrigeration systems. LinkedIn ca uh, campus commissary in Sunnyvale, and I think Anna will speak to this as well. Um, there's, we helped them design an 8,500 square foot um, commissary kitchen, including a test and demo kitchen. Uh, integrated into this design are smart, flexible utility walls, uh, compact disconnect solutions in the, in the panels, um, and also some really high quality all electric solutions in this all electric kitchen. A couple of images, test kitchen on the left, and then some of the equipment lineups on the right with the utility walls. And then LinkedIn's food hall concept in Sunnyvale. Uh, this is approximately 8,000 square feet of food service design areas, kind of tied to the equipment, measured tied to the equipment on the first and third floors with similar features, all electric, of course. And a few images of the different food hall concepts. And then finally, Stanford Center for Academic Medicine in Palo Alto, the Arbor Cafe Bistro, coffee bar, wine bar, and catering kitchen. Stanford went in, went all in on, on this all electric kitchen with their new Arbor Cafe. We wanted to open an exhi exhibition kitchen with a central unified cooking suite. Unlike in Europe where manufacturers have had a plethora of electric options that could be built in seamlessly to a unified suite, we were challenged with using available US certified brands. So working with custom fabricated solutions and a plug and play approach, we designed this bespoke all electric exhibition cooking suite using six different brands of equipment with a unified look. So just a shout out to OpenAI and their DALI 2 image generation tool, try it out, but be, be aware it's very addictive. Um, so I messed with that here, but I think uh, some, of the, some of the images are relevant to uh, kind of what's coming and where we're going. So we're seeing new developments all the time. Connected kitchens will better optimize electric cooking equipment and reduce peak demand, uh, making electrification more accessible across the board. But a global approach to kitchen design really includes things beyond uh, just electric considerations. So we're looking for efficient equipment choices across the board, uh, sub-metering and monitoring, uh, adding enhanced control systems for power, water, exhaust, and food waste. And here are some uh, kind of resources that may be of use, and I will share this with Wendy for distribution. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nahum, for the great overview. Uh, so now we're going to shift gears and uh, hone in on uh, what LinkedIn is doing from an electrification standpoint. Yeah. Um, high level, our company has committed to going carbon negative, zero waste, water positive uh, by 2030. Uh, and we also have commitments around engaging our employees and supporting green and economic growth. Uh, equitable economic growth by um, helping to uh, inspire companies to provide green jobs um, and uh, working sustainability into our uh, platform as a tool. And so from a carbon, waste, and water perspective, our food program hits 
all of those buckets very closely. And my job is to help and work together with our sustainability team and come up with strategies around how we're going to help the company reach these goals. And so um, from a global standpoint, we have 14 uh, cafes, which does include full production cafes and finishing cafes. Um, since 2021, so just in the last two years, we've opened five um, all-electric kitchens, which is very exciting. And it is our new standard moving forward for all new builds. And so far, we're at 32,000 square feet of electric kitchen space and counting and growing, uh, which is very exciting. Um, so how does this tie, how does carbon tie back to the way that we build our spaces? So the way, the way that we build buildings and kitchens directly influences a company's scope one and two emissions and three from uh, scope three emissions from a sourcing standpoint of um, products that we use to build out the spaces. Buildings are one of the largest sources of carbon for climate pollution, uh, contributing 28% of global emissions due to the energy that's used uh, for the building. Um, and so replacing natural gas in buildings with all electric designs is one of the most uh, single impactful climate mitigation steps that we can take. It's a low hanging fruit. Um, and uh, by 2025, LinkedIn will be purchasing 100% of our electricity from renewable sources. So very proud of the work that our sustainability team is doing. Um, and uh, the fact that we can work very closely with them to help the company get there faster. Um, let's see, Oop, next slide. So this uh, is from a presentation that Frontier Energy did uh, at the end of my, uh, or I think Wendy is gonna be sharing out a list of resources for you guys um, uh, that will be helpful as, you know, as guides and uh, learning opportunities. Um, you know, we're all learning, this is all new, it's new for me. So I'm also learning as, as the more and more we build out the spaces. Um, but just so in comparison, you can see the different verticals of the different types of uh, food service from schools to colleges to um, hotels. Um, but you can see that uh, <clears throat> that restaurants are um, more un energy intensive, sorry, than uh, some of the other verticals. And so we are in complete control of what we're putting, what equipment we're picking and putting in the space and the amount of energy that it takes to be able to operate in our spaces. Uh, another really fascinating, um, uh, really fascinating information is that the electrical appliances are more efficient, they heat quickly, they uh, can, are able to uh, uh, touch the product more efficiently. And so there have been studies that have been done here, the sources that show the differences between the, their gas and electric counterparts, um, which is pretty fascinating. And from a workplace standpoint, so what are, what are we doing within LinkedIn Workplace? Uh, we have dedicated folks that are actively doing studies right now to compare indoor indoor air quality between our gas powered cafe and an all electric cafe. And they are looking at what they call uh, volatile organic compounds. See, I'm not doing this study, uh, but we'll finally have some great uh, data from our sites to be able to look at this. And we can't, you know, hopefully we can share soon uh, once they're done doing the analysis, but it's uh, very exciting to be able to have more proof around the fact that electric kitchens are a healthier environment for the cooks in the space. Uh, we're also looking at improving the way that things are submetered. So this is a learn as we go type of thing. Um, we had a, so for our headquarters, for example, we have a cafe that is uh, older and it's still gas, but it was never, the kitchen was never submetered. So we don't have a clear picture of the um, uh, utility consumption for just from the kitchen. We have the building. And so our engineering team here is working on addressing that so that we can get a true picture, a side by side photo of or image or comparison of the energy consumption between the gas cafe and our all electric food hall, which is on the same campus. 
So same population, different types of kitchens. It'll be fascinating once we get some actual reliable data on that. And so the food program's role in all this is electrifying our kitchens to eliminate the reliance on fossil fuels. Um, and we're also looking at electrification of, of, of the vehicle fleets that support our program. We are in a campus setting, and so there's a lot of box trucks and all kinds of cars that support our program and moving catering around. And so uh, doing a phased approach to electrify that vehicle fleet is another strategy. Uh, so here's a, a, a quote that made me smile from the Omaha culinary team saying that the ovens, flat tops, kettles, and fires are very comparable. We would have not known they were electric. Um, so from a operational standpoint, the, the teens are very pleased with the equipment, and um, uh, I just wanted to share that with you guys. Um, so here's the positives. I will also share some learnings. Um, so from an operation standpoint, and this is feedback from our teams in Dublin, Ireland, and in the U.S., so that we were able to get multiple types of perspectives. Um, it's a lot cleaner, less infrastructure. Um, there's uh, eliminating the gas removes cost of statutory maintenance and you know specific engineers with that are registered gas installed certified. Um, no gas leaks anymore. Um, you know, gas leaks are always a, a big scare and uh, you know, a health hazard and safety issue. Um, more instant performance, uh, no pilot lights failing, uh, or grease in the gas gas jets. Uh, easier to clean too from a maintenance standpoint when they're wrapping up their day and service is over. It's, you know, it's a wipeable service surface. Um, from a design standpoint, you can achieve the same look of, you know, aesthetic look on the line. And uh, the lack of residual heat allows for placement of the equipment right next to each other. So a lot of the times you might need some sort of guard in case so the cooks don't burn themselves, but um, this is a more controlled environment. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. Lessons learned. So we did run into a lot of supply chain delays with replacement parts, um, which I think, you know, the whole world is dealing with that. But um, sorry, I still have a tickle in my throat. One sec. Um, some of the cooks and chefs did require an adjustment period. Um, some had never cooked on induction before. And so getting proper training done by the manufacturers is essential. Uh, you know, there are a bunch of different types of brands of the induction equipment that we ordered. Uh, it's a challenge to try to get them all out, but please, you know, establish relationships with your reps so that you can get your team the proper training. And it might be worth recording the training due to staff turnover or, you know, moving staff around to different locations. Um, so we're learning that not all the pot sizes will work on certain uh, size of the induction uh, induction burners. And um, the material type of your pot obviously has to work with induction as well. Um, and uh, as Nahum mentioned, some cooking techniques are slightly more difficult to achieve. For example, like woks, high heat cooking with woks or charring that, you know, wood burned kind of uh, technique as well, obviously cannot be achieved without the wood. But, um, you know, we have some, we have an electric uh, pizza oven here at the food hall and in Omaha, and it's, the performance is awesome and we're getting great quality product out of it. So, so it, it, it does take adjustment from a culinary standpoint. Um, and Technicians, facilities technicians and engineers, a lot of this equipment is new for them. And so they're learning as well. And so it might take a little bit of time to, for repairs and uh, for the onsite team that's supporting the facilities management to be able to be up to speed as well. Oh, there it goes again. Okay, uh, from a design standpoint, uh, this was a big learning for us in Omaha. Um, it snows during the winter. I don't know if you know this. And there's no residual heat in the kitchen. And when deliveries are being made from the loading dock, it is freezing in the kitchen. And so they've actually had to look at, uh, at uh, adding heaters to the space. So one 
little but large thing to keep in mind if you are building out some things where it snows. Um, and then planning in advance with your sustainability team to see what kind of data they're going to need. Um, and also working with engineer, your engineers or your food service consultant, your architects, everyone involved to make sure that you're planning ahead for capturing the data that you're going to need to be able to, you know, look at ROI or just energy consumption um, or analysis. Um, so, th and that's kind of what we're dealing with right now too, is making sure that we're putting in submeters in the right locations. Uh, here's some photos of the spaces. So this is Omaha, nice and beautiful back of house. Um, it's also a food hall concept. Here's another look at the other end of it. Here's that electrical. On the right is the pizza oven I was telling you about. The team is very pleased with it. Um, and we do have the rationale units, which are working great. Mountain View Food Hall. Uh, this is the one that Nahum was referencing. Uh, we're feeding about 1,300 folks every day. Um, and this is the back of house here. Um, Double-sided cook line, lots of prep space, natural lighting. It's really nice. And then uh, moving over to our teaching kitchen and commissary. So it's this little portion of that space is our uh, on-site teaching kitchen for employees to use for classes with uh, AV and video, which is very nice and fun. Um, and then uh, let's see, kitchen. Here's our beautiful commissary area. Lots of cooking power. Here's the other side. Lots of pressure cookers for high batch, lots of um, stocks and soups and braised meats and such. And this is Dublin, Ireland. Also very pleased with the equipment. And we are currently designing a, uh, a large cafe to service 2,200 employees in Bangalore, India. Um, so we're very excited for that. And um, I, the, I do have a list of resources that I will hand over to um, Wendy to share with you all. Um, but that's it for me. Thank you so much. Great. So we have some time for questions now, and I see that they have been coming in. Um, I'd like to first start off with a, a little bit more background on the air quality study that you were mentioning, Anna. Um, we had some attendees who were curious about kind of the, the nuts and bolts of how you were measuring the air quality. I guess I'm, I'm imagining that they're thinking, you know, what's the frequency of these kinds of measurements? And also, again, um, is this information you said going to be available uh, at some future date? Yeah, so I'm not doing the study myself, so I will have to get more details for you guys, but I'm happy to ask the team that's running it. She's based in EMEA, so um, give me a couple days and I'll get more information for you guys. Uh, I think it would be very relevant to our industry to be able to share the results, so I will definitely push for that and I will have to circle back uh, with you guys. So make sure you have Wendy's email um, and or feel free to reach out on LinkedIn too. Perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, so to kind of connect uh, to the theme of air quality, uh, Nahum, you were mentioning that ventless equipment was a possibility with uh, electric kitchens, and that was a, a real cost saver. So can you describe a little bit more what you mean by the ventless equipment? And um, are there kind of standards of, of uh, how this meets air quality standards, things like that? Okay, thanks. Um, I think in general, the ventless equipment has to meet certain air quality standards in order and uh, particulate capture in order to be approved for, you know, use in commercial food service. The types of equipment, anything from what you see, say at uh, Starbucks for a reheat, the Turbo Chef type ovens, they have catalytic converters inside them that uh, capture and contain the particulate. They, uh, there are combi ovens that are ventless that have ventless hood attachments. Um, all of these units still have some sort of heat that comes off of them. So you have to have general uh, ventilation in the space. Um, but uh, ventless equipment can also be a downdraft griddle. Uh, so that would integrate 
an, a built-in Ansel system and a kind of a pollution control unit with filtration underneath the unit. Great, thank you so much. So it, it sounded from both of your presentations as though, um, well, especially yours, Nahum, you mentioned that cost, there's a sort of myth that things will cost a lot more from the equipment perspective if you're going electric. And you pointed out that that's not a, a true myth, that that should be um, a myth that's busted. But um, can you talk a little bit more about the sort of um, reasons that people might still be hesitant to go all electric if if there are other barriers besides this perceived cost barrier um, and how you can sort of overcome some of these hesitancies? Is it just about more communication and, and getting the word out and um, seeing more of these success stories? Or how, how can we get more people on this train of, of electrification? I can speak to that. Um, so I think that having the ability to go and see equipment in use if, if someone is concerned about some sort of new technology as being able to go to a place like, for instance, Frontier Energy uh, Fishnik out in San Ramon has a, a test kitchen where any anyone can basically go out there for training or rep groups can host events with their equipment and give hands-on uh, test opportunities with food product. Um, I think there are other barriers. The cost barriers don't go away completely. If you're doing a new a new kitchen and you have adequate electrical supply there, then there's you know then you're halfway there. If you're doing a retrofit, those can be very costly. If you don't have enough uh, equipment uh, energy, uh, electrical supply to your building, so that can really affect the the cost for the uh, kind of the capital expenditures. Any other thoughts, Anna? I didn't want to cover. Uh, no, just to, to add to the retrofit uh, component as well, um, not all buildings are owned by the companies that operate in them. And so a lot of the time it's a partnership with the landlord and or a landlord driven decision. Uh, and I think that's something that is not uh, often spoken about. And so that's uh, another component to it all is, you know, like we have we have a kitchen in the Empire State Building and that's a historic building uh, that was built uh, with gas initially. And this was probably like seven years ago. So um, there, there's all types of restrictions around uh, historic buildings as well and, and working with the city and the landlord, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not a clear cut uh, yes or no with, with regard to the retrofitting too. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, I I think one of the other attendees asked a question about retrofits at LinkedIn. Is that something that you have on the horizon for those buildings that you do have control over, or are you focused mostly on the new construction for now? Most we uh, we don't own all of our buildings. Um, headquarters we own. Uh, all the other ones, I'm pretty sure, are all leased out. So uh, that is a strategy that I am uh, have I have to work with the sustainability team to look at what that looks like you know from a workplace standpoint it's also you know what's the cost to retrofit what's the long-term plan for occupying this building you know you know does it make sense or are we going to move out in two years and so it doesn't make sense so there's a lot of factors involved and um, we don't have a solid stance on that just yet because it's getting developed great thank you uh, we had a few questions come in about the idea of the peak demand, because of course electrification only works when you have the sufficient renewable energy supply to, to lower those carbon emissions, um, and you're not having to to resort to some other you know source for that electricity. So, uh, can one of you please speak to how the electric kitchen can manage its power requirements in such a way that uh, the peak demand is kind of controlled or, or offset at, at times. Does that make sense as a question? I can speak to that. So I think there's technologies that are pretty well um, established in the European uh, market that are not quite here yet um, that actually connect, interconnect with cooking equipment. Anything that has a thermostat, for instance, fryers, ovens, uh, griddles and such. And they can actually regulate the demand from that piece of equipment in a smart way 
so as to minimally, if not even unnoticeably, uh, affect you know the the culinary aspect. So in that way, they could set peaks by having this interconnected um, arrangement through a smart controller, and modulate and and you know moderate the peak so it can't exceed a certain amount, a set amount. Do you ever see kitchens wanting to put in um, battery storage to help with the demands? I, in, from my perspective, I've seen battery storage for more mobile uh, equipment solutions, but um, not on the level of, but I'm sure it exists. That's kind of in the electrical, overall electrical engineering design of the energy supply for the building. Mm -hmm. um, another question we have, well, I had this question, which was, you talked about the training that's involved with getting chefs up to speed and also getting engineers and and um, maintenance people up to speed. Would you say, uh, what would you say the length of time was in, in having that sort of ramping up period for staff? Um, are we talking like six months? Are we talking a year? How, how long does it take for people to get we used to this? We never get six months, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so funny. That's a great question. Uh, we like to ask for 30 days uh, pre-FDOB, pre-opening of occupying the space so that the teams have the ability to get training. Um, sometimes we don't get that uh, at all. You know, supply chain delays, uh, subcontractors not showing up when they should have um is issues always come up and so once the space is delivered is when our food service folks can go in uh and play with the equipment get familiar with it get the training that they need um we also don't have all chefs we have hourly cooks as well who are not as well versed or as experienced as the chefs and so i think people have to remember that too that they need they need a little bit of extra training as well um, and so Nahum had mentioned Frontier Energy is a really great local uh, solution to be able to get some of that hands-on training as well through them. So highly recommend reaching out to them. Uh, so yeah, it's not, it's also never a clear amount of time. The more time you can get for the training, the better. Uh, because of staff turnover, I think doing annual training and including the engineers and facilities teams with the cooks uh, all at once uh, is a really great way to, you know, uh, knock off the training for the different types of groups that will be interacting with the equipment. That's great. Yeah. Um, so speaking of the cooks, I, I do hear that electric kitchens have a great advantage for cooks because it's just not such a noisy place and it's not such a hot place, well, like, with the exception of the, the winter Omaha people. Um, you know, generally those those conditions can be kind of stressful. And so can you speak a little bit more about some of these other benefits for staff? Yeah, I mean, something as simple as like, you know, your your panhandle, you don't need a towel to grab it uh, from the residual heat coming off of a gas stove, for example. Um, you know, setting your hand on accident on the glass, uh, there, there might be residual heat from the pot. So the pot heats up um the entire pot will heat up to heat your food so the glass is is generally safe uh to the touch so less burns um easier to easier to operate in the space honestly it's safer yeah that's really great um here's a question that came in are you aware of any culinary institutes that may be switching from gas to electric in training chefs for the future i think that's a great question i'm not aware of any? I think that any kitchen you go into these days, is you're going to see induction cooking, um, particularly culinary institutes. Um, so I would say that most, if not all, have some sort of pathway, at least to experience the equipment. Um, you know, when we do demo kitchens for schools and things, you know, some people are asking for some kind of legacy gas equipment, but alongside the electric, just so that people will learn how to turn on a gas knob, you know? <laughs> so I, I don't think it's such a new thing for, for culinary schools across yeah. the board. And you have a lot of experience, I gather, in uh, other parts of the world, Nahum. So you've probably seen uh, the popularity of electrification in, in these other countries. 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think the European market, and I was in, in Israel for quite a few years working, um, all electric kitchens were a very common uh, solution, um, kind of steps, bounds, and leaps ahead of what's going on here, um, although we're really catching up nicely. Are there any really popular brands um, that are kind of the first and foremost brands in Europe that we should be aware of? I think all the brands will have gas and electric options from the, the main European manufacturers and the different groups. Um, you know, not to endorse like a particular brand, but you know, Electrolux has everything in electric and gas. Ambach has everything in electric and gas. That's one of the things when we were doing Stanford Center for Academic Medicine was we were looking for this unified cooking suite. And if it was a European project or if we had the time or the money or the intention to bring over a European cooking suite, we could have brought it all electric um, with all the parts and pieces built in. In this case, we decided to go with a plug and play solution. So we had Pitco fryers on and Pitco uh, pasta cookers, plug and play. We had the rational oven sitting on a lowered section. Wells was used for griddles and uh, charboiler. And then uh, Cooktech was used, uh, integrated into a Montague uh, refrigerated base. And then Montague kind of executed the fabrication of the unified look. Great. And, uh, and Wendy, I, I would like to address, I think a couple of times the plant-based uh, food came up. Uh, so the electrification of the kitchens is a strategy for scope one and two reductions more so. Uh, scope three has a whole other list of strategies that I've been working to develop and uh, responsible sourcing is a huge uh, area of opportunity supporting local where possible. Uh, all of that falls under scope three. And we have been proactively uh, transitioning towards uh, more plant forward menuing uh, around the world. So we are definitely doing that. Yeah, I actually uh, listened to a podcast that you were interviewed in about switching uh, with Greener by default and how you were yep. changing the menus. And it was just a great story. So I'm really excited for that. Uh, let's see what other questions we have coming in here. Um, we do have a question about backup power that you might need for an electric kitchen. I'm guessing that you have to have some sort of non-electric backup for if there's an outage. If so, for in our world of design, if it's a hospital, and it's an emergency kitchen, then you have to have an emergency plan. And so there's usually backup generators. For the yeah. non kind of healthcare facilities, they usually are either shutting down if there's a power outage and finding other alternatives of feeding people. Great. Yeah, I think it does make sense if you're in a very high risk situation that you need to have some kind of reliable backup. Maybe in the future, we can have more um, more possibilities that don't involve mm -hmm. fossil fuels. But for now, that, that does seem like a, one of those things that has to happen. Um, there is a question uh, coming in about walks and whether these sorts of specific hard to deal with um, equipment uh, have various options for electric. And uh, Anna, would you like to take that one? Uh, yes. So um, Microsoft actually worked with, uh, I think it was Volrath or Vulcan. I don't recall the manufacturer. They just released a brand new walk that I got to see in person uh, live and eat the food that came off of it. And it was amazing. Uh, pretty much the cook, for anyone that has uh, experience in the kitchen, the cook could have his pint containers immediately next to his wok with all of his ingredients and, you know, that he was throwing in without melting everything. <laughs> and um, it, the instant heat, high, high heat, it was awesome. Um, one of the resources that are on my list that Wendy will share out with you is the uh, white page that Microsoft uh, released about their new all electric kitchen. And you'll find more information about, uh, about that there. Um, and I think if you Google it too, they got some PR on it uh, as well. But the technology is coming. It's we, we just have to be patient and provide feedback, you know, 
for any manufacturers. Uh, Frontier Energy is it's a testing kitchen as well, uh, I believe, right, Nahum? Yes. And so um, it's coming. It's not perfect in all applications, but it's coming and more is going to come. So I'm hopeful. Yeah. And there's a whole array of uh, induction cooktops as well as concave walks and also high power. There's a high power walk out at Frontier last I visited there recently. So, um, you know, it's there. And it, in Asia, it's been around for quite some time. So uh, seeing those high power walks come into this market for the appropriate application, we're seeing it already. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, at Actera, we also for home cooks offer this uh, induction cooktop loaner program, which includes flat bottom walks that you can pair with the induction cooktop. And it's, you know, it is a flat bottom, but it is the walk pan. So it's uh, pretty exciting that they have these technologies now. Uh, there was one other question that came up um, about hiring culinary staff who already know how to work with electric um, and whether that's something that that you're considering at LinkedIn. Um, feel free to send me a list of their names and their emails. <laughs> um, our, it's challenging enough right now to hire enough people. Uh, so staff shortages are still a real thing. Um, and so training within is, is, you know, it contributes to personal professional growth. Uh, you're, you're not hiring, having to deal with, you know, more HR stuff with hiring new and new people. So if you have the talent on site, train from within and grow from within as the primary goal, and then you can outsource, um, if you have, you know, wh wherever it's needed. So we do hire specialty cooks, example, for, for example, for different types of cuisines. Um, there are not a lot of expert induction cooking cooks out there that um, could be affordable as well. So that's why the internal training is the more approachable, accessible option. I think also really briefly on training. So generally for commercial food service projects across the board, um, part of the commissioning is required by the contract for the food service provider and the equipment provider. So they need to come and do a technical startup and then they need to do uh, demos and training for this for the actual operational staff. So as, as much as you can get ahead of that on projects is you'll be in better shape, whether it's just testing in advance for new technology type things, going to the factory um, or uh, setting up trainings at Frontier or other test kitchens that the represented the, the manufacturers reps have in the Bay Area. So just you know, keep in mind that the manufacturers are so very interested in having a successful experience with their equipment, uh, especially on larger contract projects and design consultant projects and key client projects. They will be there multiple times for training. Just have to ask. Fantastic. Uh, so I'd like to close with a, kind of a, an optimistic closing, and I was hoping both of you could comment on something that you're looking forward to here in 2023 for electric kitchens um, in your perspective. And uh, I'll let either one of you start with that. Surprise questions always get me. Go ahead, Nahum. <laughs> more exciting projects, more exciting clients to work with, um, more, you know, new applications coming from the manufacturers, new technology, um, new studies and solutions. I mean, that's what I'm kind of looking forward to. And we're, we're just never a dull moment in this industry. So mm -hmm. usually not disappointed. Yeah, and the more and more kitchens get built out, I think the the sharing of best practices and lessons learned is is critical, um, so that we're not repeating the same mistakes every time there's a new build. And we you know we're all trying to get to the same thing, <laughs> um, healthier planet. Uh, and so, yeah, I think the data data sharing whenever we have it. That's why I do think that you know with our air quality study, hopefully we can get that published externally. Um, but yeah, and also. Uh, innovation in some of the hard to cook with equipment is, you know, like grills and walks and, you know, making those more accessible as well. Cause right now it's the, the, the one that I saw at Microsoft was just from one manufacturer. Um, and so, um, yeah, seeing innovations around that and, and globally, 
not just U.S. focus. That's wonderful. Thank you both so much. We've been really excited to have you and have your expertise. I know both of you have very interesting backgrounds and lots of different skills. So thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. Um, there will be a, a post-event survey coming your way in this email that I'll send out to everyone. And eventually we will also share the link to this recording. Um, so everyone will have access to that. And uh, yeah, thank you both so much, um, Anna, Nahum, you've both been wonderful. Um, and we'll look forward to hearing all of your great successes in the next few months. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you.